Technology has had an ever-changing effect on human history. Its evolution has had an ever-changing effect on our life experiences. Scientific know-how has changed our analytical and physical world and has jettisoned our modern society toward a faster and seemingly more efficient digital universe. A good example of our digital revolution is how humans have evolved in the field of communications. We have ping-ponged from smoke signals and handwritten letters to the revolution of the printing press, and each new stage of development has had a major impact on society. There are companies on the leading edge of this technology who are creating a monetary revolution. The topic of the New York Bitcoin license that was established in New York City in 2015 has generated a lot of concern in the Bitcoin startup industry. Organizations like CRY SPA set out to create standards in this fledgling industry. CRY SPA's members individually establish, and publish, and monitor standards and best practices that bring greater safety and reliability to the use of cryptocurrency technology, for example, bitcoins and altcoins. CRY SPA's community can then influence global governments and banks' response to cryptocurrency and not wait for rules and regulations that inhibit freedom and equality, transparency, and privacy. In addition, CRY SPA and its members set out to create tools that comply with its collective interests, backed by CYRSPA's collective efforts, knowledge, and coordination. My name is Manny Perez, and I'm co-chair of the Cryptocurrency Standards Association. We call it CRIPSA. And our organization is basically member-driven, peer-to-peer. Everybody who's a member is equal in voice. And we bring together all the voices to create one voice. And that one voice of all of us together then can go into the wild west of that new financial industry that is the promise of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And we start not only mapping the territory of that wild west, but establishing how we're going to work together stabilizing the craziness, creating even new opportunities thanks to the coordination of all the voices where an IBM will be the same as a student coder who's in Indonesia or in the Ukraine, South Africa, South America, anywhere. Because the great thing about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is that it's global. It's not a jurisdiction, it's not one country, and it's not even one form of money. It's just Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, the mathematics, your computer. The concept of top-down central authority telling people what to do doesn't work with Bitcoin, doesn't work with the blockchain. So we need an organization where self-governance is possible. It is expected, though, that New York State legislation will be used to design legislation in other states. And New York State likes being the first, so they are. CRIPSA in the future will be the voice of the people involved in cryptocurrency. We will have different foundations, different groups, even probably governments participating as members. But we will be a community of peers, of equals. We'll be following what we understand are Satoshi Nakamoto's four standards, his four principles that are in his white paper. Freedom. That's the freedom to participate in this new industry if you've got a computer. Equality. Equality means peer-to-peer. -peer. Everybody's the same. Nobody's more powerful. Transparency. In the blockchain, everything can be seen. Nothing's hidden. And privacy. Privacy because we use pseudonyms. We use public and private keys to maintain our privacy without trying to hide our transaction and when we're dealing with commerce, the merchant has to keep the same public key and he will be identified. 
and usually the customer will want to be identified also, but in a private manner. That means there are four basic principles. Will there be more standards? Yes, but they'll come from the community, hopefully not from a government. The subject of Bitcoin is discussed amongst academic schools like King's College in Lower Manhattan. The Digital Roundtable is an open floor discussion event that focuses on the benefits and possible uses of the Bitcoin technology. One question asked is, how does Bitcoin help with democratization of the monetary process? How will that change the paradigm, give ownership back to the people here and around the world, and alleviate financial tension? Exchange, most people would agree, started with bartering. And so that was the ultimate uh, democratization of money. There wasn't any money, and so if you wanted something, you grew wheat, you had to go to the shoemaker and say, if you, if you need wheat, I'll give you X, X bushels in exchange where you make me some shoes. And so money was in control of the people because the money at the time was commodities trading, basically. And it wasn't until that people figured out that certain things were rare. And some of those rare things were metals that were durable and that could be made uh, because they had value in them, like uh, gold. So this is a one ounce gold coin. Is that real? It's real, it's real gold. Mm -hmm. And it was made back when the gold standard cost $20 an ounce. And so a $20 coin had one ounce of gold in it because it was worth $20. Hmm. And that's where the government started coming in and said, we're, gonna, we're going to take that away from the people and centralize it and standardize it so that we make the coins consistently. Uh, and if we have a certain branding reputation for being honest, then people will know that this is one ounce. So they don't have to test it every single time you have a transaction. And so governments have assumed then the trusted authority in determining the value of currency. Well, that began to degrade when uh, during World War II, there wasn't enough gold to create enough money to pay for all the things that needed to be built in order to win the war. And so Roosevelt took us off the gold standard and we went to what's now known as the commodities exchange standard. So there was gold in the bank, but now we have paper bills that say, uh, you can redeem this for $10 worth of gold. And eventually the redemption part went away and what determined value for currency is called government fiat. It's by government order or their fiat that tells you legally you have no choice to accept this paper bill as one dollar because the government tells you you have to accept it as a dollar. And that's then where you migrate into, when you start printing money haphazardly, uh, that fiat currency can be devalued because it's not linked necessarily to anything of value. And uh, can anyone uh, name the highest denominated bill that was ever in circulation That's worldwide? Good. Does anyone know what that is? Yes. Yes. What? Yes. This is a $100 trillion bill from Zimbabwe. So what you have with Bitcoin that's so radical is because of its public ledger and the way the technology works, is you now have a trusted third party that is not the government that can confirm the transaction. And therefore, you don't need the government anymore being that trusted third party. And what happens then over time is because governments have a monopoly, virtually all monopolies end up with similar behavior. They manipulate the price to keep it high um, they end up uh, using their uh, monopolistic power to keep that power through crony capitalist uh, um, relationships. And uh, they use that money for purposes other than a medium of exchange. The symbols that are put on a coin uh, promote the uh, power and image and values of a particular country. And, uh, and that is overlaid uh, when you, uh, it's overlaid on money, so you have the power and the money, and whoever has that, which is the country, then controls. 
And so there are a lot of other reasons than that money is, uh, is used in a non-democratized fashion that Bitcoin just blows apart because it provides that uh, independent third-party verification where you don't need government anymore. Helping to spread the technology and the use of Bitcoin amongst businesses, Coin.co is one of the startups taking the lead in digital finance and remittance. Hi, I'm Alex Waters. I run the company Coin.co, and we're a Bitcoin company. We help businesses try to understand, understand the Bitcoin landscape and educate them about how Bitcoin can be useful uh, to businesses and organizations. Um, so I, gr I grew up here in New York, and uh, I, I've been programming since I was pretty little. Um, studied software engineering at RIT, and I've been doing um, management and, and, and development um, of software products in, in New York for about 10 years. Um, I got involved with Bitcoin really early on in uh, working on the open source project and I attended the first Bitcoin conference and um, it's sort of taken me by hold. Um, I guess I, I always had an interest in cryptology and Bitcoin seemed to be the most interesting thing. Um, and so I started working on it and it's, it's taken hold of me over the past five years and so um, I hope to work on it for a long time and uh, I'm really passionate about it. Coin.co is a Bitcoin payments company. We help businesses accept Bitcoin but receive US dollar. We also help companies understand the Bitcoin landscape and build products for their existing uh, business line. I've been working on Bitcoin for about five years. I worked on core development. I oversaw operations and development at BitInstant. I um, started an incubator here in New York and um, have built several companies since then. Um, but currently I'm the CEO, CEO of Coin.co. I don't think we can classify Bitcoin as a, as a commodity or as a currency. I think placing a, a sort of label on it is, is difficult. And it, in some contexts, it, it fits the same description. Um, but it's, it's such a new thing. It's sort of like, um, you know, and this happens with all technology. When, when cars came out, they were called the, uh, the horseless buggy. Or, um, you know, so it's hard to sort of label it as something we're already familiar with because it's entirely different. These large financial institutions realize that Bitcoin is a powerful technology. And I think it's taken some, uh, uh, some time to get to that place. Uh, there was a period where the public opinion of Bitcoin was sort of misinformed. And that's changing now, and it's being taken more seriously. And so, therefore, you see uh, large organizations investing in research development and just exploring um, the possibilities of the new tech. You know, when Bill Gates was on Letterman, I think for his first appearance there, he was explaining the internet, and they were, the audience and, and David Letterman were kind of laughing at him, saying, well, why would people use why aren't people going to just send letters to each other or use encyclopedias? Why would they use this internet? And uh, so, I mean, in retrospect, that's kind of funny. And it, but, but that shows us that history repeats itself, right? Like, we right. can look at those examples and say, well, it's kind of taking this similar course here where people don't understand it and they sort of laugh it off and then it slowly becomes ingrained in our lives. Bitcoin may be the future of money. Never before in the history of finance has there been a currency that is so flexible, transparent, and versatile like Bitcoin. Digital currency will ultimately replace physical cash as a means of exchange and enable a more free and open banking system. Technological innovations sometimes take time to grow and for the public to embrace. Acceptance sometimes takes time, and history will have the last word. The internet has imbued humankind with the power of information at its fingertips and has disrupted long-standing infrastructures like the music industry, commerce, communications, and now finance. The idea of a non-centralized open source money has had the potential to change our world and give new freedoms to individuals globally. The idea of a non-centralized open source economy has the potential to change our world and give new freedoms to individuals globally.